Let's get started. Uh, Pastor Brian is on his way with his wife out of town, and um, just want to remind you that next week is there's no team. I know most of you know that, but it's Thanksgiving, obviously, the day before, so there's no team next week, next Friday, that is. And, uh, you know, I, I, Brian gives me options when it comes to the jokes, and I appreciate that. Although I have to say it was slim pickings this week. All right, here you ready? A big city lawyer went duck hunting in rural Tennessee. Wow. That tells you I chose this one. You, no groaning till the end. <laughs> He shot and dropped a bird, but it fell into a farmer's field on the other side of the fence. As the lawyer climbed over the fence to collect the bird, an elderly farmer drove up on his tractor and asked him what he was doing. The lawyer replied, I shot a duck, and it fell in this field, and I'm going to retrieve it. The old farmer looked the lawyer in the eyes and stated firmly, this is my property, and you're not coming over here. The lawyer huffed angrily, I'm one of the best trial attorneys in the country. If you don't let me get my duck, I'll sue you for everything you're worth. You'll lose this farm. The old farmer smiled. Apparently, you don't know how we do things down here in Tennessee. We settle small disagreements like this with the Tennessee three-kick rule. The lawyer asked, what's the Tennessee three-kick rule? The farmer answered, well, first I kick you three times, and then you kick me three times, and so on, until someone finally gives up. The attorney thought about the proposed contest and decided he could easily take the old codger, and he agreed to abide by the local custom. The old farmer slowly climbed down from his tractor, walked up to the lawyer. His first kick to the shin had the lawyer hopping around on one foot, when suddenly the farmer planted the toe of his heavy work boot into the lawyer's groin and dropped him to his knees. The attorney was flat in his belly when the farmer's third kick to his kidney nearly caused him to pass out. The lawyer summoned every bit of his will and managed to get back to his feet and said, okay, you old coot, now it's my turn. At which point the farmer said, nah, just kidding, you can have the duck. <laughs> See, thank you, Glenn. That's right. <laughs> All right. Last, last week's... Um, Last week's question, if you were here last week, was the question, who do you say that I am? The question Jesus asked, particularly of Peter, but of his disciples. Perhaps the most important question any of us could ever answer in our lives, who do you say that Jesus is? It's the question of lordship. Who is he to you specifically? To set up this morning's question, I want to show you a clip from a movie uh, that ho I'm presuming most of you have seen. If not, I would encourage you, it's, it's worth seeing, called Saving Private Ryan. Not, it's not the uh, beach landing scene, which will leave you all traumatized, but it's a different scene, which I think is poignant to the question. Sea Marshal, General, Chief of Staff. with you, I, I wasn't sure how I'd feel coming back here. Every day, I think about what you said to me that day on the bridge. I've tried to live my life the best I could. I hope that was enough. I hope that at least in your eyes, I've earned what all of you have done for me. John H. Miller.
for those of you that perhaps haven't seen the movie, that's the end of the movie. That's, that character is Private Ryan as an old man, played by Matt Damon, saved by uh, Tom Hanks' character as Captain. And he's, you can hear the dialogue, hopefully you can hear it, where he's talking to him. My family's with me today. Every day I've tried to live up to and earn this, what you did for me that day on the bridge, and it's, he saved, they saved his life at the expense of the entire unit, or company anyway. And then he says to his wife, did you hear it? Tell me I've lived a good life. Tell me I've been a good man. That's the question. The question of goodness. How good is good enough? I think every man can relate to that question at some level. Uh, have I lived a good life? Have I done enough? Have I been good enough? I remember when my son Noah, who's my oldest son, 21 now, when he turned nine, I was driving home uh, on Randall Road from an appointment up in Elgin, and it was his birthday. And I was trying to get home early because so we got up from school, we we're going to have a party. <laughs> I vividly remember like this weird panic attack. He's nine. He's nine. He's nine. If he leaves home at 18 and goes to college and doesn't move back in for a decade, that means he's almost, it's half over. <laughs> half of the time he has under my roof with me as his father is gone. And I had this weird moment like, have I been good enough? Have I done enough? Have I, has it been, has it been okay? And I think with, with every area of your life, as a father, as a husband, as a, as a man in the, in the workforce, in your life, just as a friend, you, don't you have these questions sometimes? Am, am, I, am I a good man? I want to know deep down inside, am I a good man? I often will ask guys the question, what do you think God thinks of you? If I ask you that question, what do you think God thinks of you? Almost invariably, every one of our minds goes to where? How good we are? How many of, you write, how many of your minds go right to all the good things you're doing? How many of your minds go right to the, uh, I'm not that great. <laughs> I got some rough edges. I've got some things I need to work out in my life. Our minds go there because even though we want to be good men, and there's this desire to know, am I good? Am I good enough? We're also acutely aware of the places where we're not so good. It's such a poignant scene. And it brings us to the text we want to read from Mark chapter, uh, chapter 10, verses 17 through 22, Jesus' encounter with a man about this very question, sometimes called the rich young ruler. Only... Oh, actually, only Mark tells us he, he was a ruler. Matthew and Luke also recount the story. We know that he's rich, and he comes to Jesus with this question. Matthew, or excuse me, Mark 10, 17. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I've kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go, sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this the man's face fell, and he went away sad because he had great wealth. First thing here is a good man. He calls Jesus good teacher. If you ask a random person, not what does God think of you, but what does God want from you? What does God expect from you? What does God require of you? Most people would say to be good. Most of you would say that. And, I, and that's not wrong. God would prefer that you're good rather than bad. But by what standard? What is goodness in the eyes of God? That's the guy in the story. He says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he comes to Jesus with this question. We'll come back to the question itself in a few moments. And Jesus answers this question with what? A question, which is something Jesus frequently does. I sometimes would try to do that. You know, if you're, uh, this, the, uh, answering a question with a question is something that Jesus does brilliantly to drive at somebody's heart. Sometimes we use it as a way to deflect having to face the issue. And I remember, I remember vividly when I was in high school learning the Socratic method. You know, you answer questions with questions. It makes you sound smart. It doesn't work so well like when you're taking a test. Let me ask you a question, teacher. <laughs> Before I answer these questions, I have some questions for you. That doesn't work that well. Jesus answers the question with a question saying, why do you call me good? This is, this is really, really important to understand the story. He asked this man, why do you call me good? Are you just flattering me? Is it a title of address that's customary to the culture? Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. 
You know the commandments, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, steal or give false testimony, defraud or honor your father and mother. Jesus blows the whole good thing out of the water right away by asking this question, why do you call me good? Now, there's two, two ways to think about goodness on the human relative scale. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3 and in, in Psalm chapter 8 and other places that no one is good, no one does good, and no one seeks God. That sounds a bit like an overstatement, doesn't it? I mean, really, nobody does good ever? No one does a good thing? It's not saying no one ever does anything good on a relative human scale. Of course, people do good deeds all the time, and you don't have to be a Christ follower to do good in the world. What he's saying, what the psalmist is saying, what Paul picks up in Romans chapter 3, what he's saying when he says no one does good, he's saying, ultimately speaking, no one does good and no one seeks God purely for God's sake alone. Meaning, like Jonathan Edwards, if you know, he's an old uh, Puritan pastor and reformer of New England in the 1600s, um, a, a, a difficult guy to read, but he, he wrote a book called the, the Nature of True Virtue. And he says in there, even in our efforts to be and do good, we foster pride and fear, which are the roots of original sin. Let me explain what he means. How many of you grew up in a home where your parents said things like, we're Frasers, we don't act that way. Well, they wouldn't say Frasers unless you're a Fraser, right? We're whatever, we don't act that way. How many of you had your dad or mom say that way? Hanson's, we're Smiths, we don't, Smiths don't act that way, right? Now, what, what are they doing? They're trying to get you to behave in a good manner. By doing what? Fostering what? Pride of family. We are better than the other people who act this way. We're better than that. And that's not, the intent is good to get you to behave, but it's fostering pride, which is the root of original sin. Or fear. How many of you had a mom or an aunt say, just wait till your father gets home? Anybody ever hear that before? I heard that frequently in my house. <laughs> One time I had to shovel the yard. We had an acre and a half, not the driveway, the yard. We were the only house on the block that had green grass in the middle of winter because I got suspended from school. That's another story. <laughs> where, I, where, I, where I wasn't good. I That's right. <laughs> this has been recorded, so anyway. <laughs> but, but I heard that all the time. So what, what is she saying? We want you to behave, and there's fear of punishment, and so it's, a, a, again, a corrective measure to get me to be a good boy by fostering fear. Fear of punishment, pride of family. Efforts to get us to toe the line, to be good. But they're fostering something in us. This is what the psalmist means, what Paul means. No one does good, not a good deed. Of course we do. He means at your, at the, if you strip away enough layers of the onion, you get down deep enough, nobody's ultimately purely good for good and God's sake alone. We all have mixed motives. There's fear and pride even in our goodness, he's saying. That's why Jesus says to this guy, what do you call me good? Do you even know what you're saying when you call me good? Because no one is good except God alone. No one is purely good except God alone. Meaning, if you're calling me good, do you mean that I'm God? You could translate it that way. Is that what you're saying to me? You aren't as good as you think you are. Then he lists his co the commandments to prove his point. Now, there were 613 commandments in the Levitical law, the Pharisees. So he, he gives them a a select few. And look at what the guy says. Teacher, all these I have kept since I was a boy. This is an astounding statement. Really? You've kept them all? Historically, I think the guy has been viewed as is dishonest. And perhaps he is. Certainly arrogant. Or he may also be self-deceived. He may be just that convinced of his goodness. But it's a remarkable thing to say. All these I've kept since I was a boy. Really? And Jesus does this frequently in the Gospels. You know, remember the story of the woman caught in adultery? You've heard this story before? How many of you heard of the story of the woman caught in adultery? Jewish leaders bring this woman who's caught, the text says, in the act of adultery. Think about that for a minute. Just her? In the act. Just her. I don't know much about this sort of thing because I'm a pastor, but I presume it takes two to tango in the act of adultery, right? Right? She's caught in the act, only her. And they bring her to be stoned. And then Jesus says, those of you without sin cast the first stone. He's, he's always calling out the hypocrisy, even that which we don't see. So I, I don't, we don't know this man's heart. It certainly appears that he's self-righteous and arrogant and maybe even deceitful. He may just be that deluded that he thinks he's good, good enough. 
C.S. Lewis, in his book, The Abolition of Man, lesser known book that he wrote, he said, the problem with most men today is we want to be called good without doing what's necessary to be good. Better that we should seek to be good men and they will be called so in truth. I think that's really right. I'd like people to view me as a good person, but I'm not paying attention to what that actually requires in my moral behavior. Second thing, a a dishonest question. There, There are times in life, I think you've experienced this as married men, most of you, when a question is really a statement and it's disguised as a question. Give you an example from my own marriage. We were, uh, my wife is a swimmer, and so she has swimmer's shoulders, and I think they're attractive, but she's always been self-conscious about it, the size of her shoulders. She's strong. And she, when we were early in our marriage, she came, we were going out to eat, and she had this dress on. She says, should I wear this dress with, sh- with shoulder pads in or out? This is in the 80s, or the early 90s. And I said, I don't know, let me see it with them out. She goes, I don't have them in. You know, <laughs> so she started crying. <laughs> that's, a, that's a setup. <laughs> you can't, that's a total setup, you know? So then I was... I, you, I learned, uh, you don't answer those kinds of questions. You look beautiful no matter what you're wearing, honey. Or, or, or have you ever had somebody ask this question? Who made that decision? I've had people ask that about around here as a church. You know, who decided that? It's not really a question. It's that's a terrible idea. Are you going to wear that? Right, they're not, they're not, they're not questions, they're statements. In verse 17, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him and said, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Perhaps this is less of a question than it is a statement from the the man. The young man's question is not entirely honest because he already thinks he's good enough. Is he looking for a little praise to show off to the crowd? We don't know. We know this, though, because he claims to have kept all the commandments since he was a young boy. We know that he thinks he's good enough. He thinks his religion has made him good enough. Now, when he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life, we think about heaven, getting into heaven, pearly gates, that kind of thing. Most of you think about that, like someday getting into heaven. And certainly that's contained in here. But in the first century, to a Jewish mind, he's not only talking about going to heaven someday. He's primarily talking about God's kingdom. And to the first century Jew, it meant when God establishes his kingdom here on earth, kingdom reign and rule, what must I do to be part of that, to have a special place in that, to be a, a member of your kingdom? That's really what he's talking about. We think about it as going off to heaven like in the clouds. He's talking about when God comes to rule and reign. Either way, he thinks he's in based on his behavior. His religion, his external goodness. I, I, um, Timothy Keller has written about this, the go- and so has Dallas Willard and John Ortberg in different books, places, co- something called The Gospel of Sin Management. Meaning, the goal is not to surrender my life to Christ, but just to, just to manage my sin, clean up my act, and present myself as good enough. I think it's fascinating, and I've not really paid attention to this in depth but until more recently. But right here in this middle of this exchange between Jesus and this man about what constitutes goodness and how you get eternal life, two pretty profound questions, wouldn't you agree? Right in the middle of this exchange, Jesus brings up money. You ever start to think about that? In the middle of a conversation about what's eternal life look like in your kingdom and what what is good in God's eyes, Jesus brings up an issue that ought to surprise us a bit. And Jesus lists some commandments for him. This is something that most people miss. He says, you know the commandments, meaning you're obviously... by your own definition, a pretty good guy. You know the commandments, and he lists commandments. He lists them from number five on down. Have you ever paid attention to the Ten Commandments? What are the first four about? Some of you who grew up in Sunday school or know a little bit about that. The first four commandments. Anybody know number one? Love the Lord your God, right? Shall have no other gods before me. And number two? Yeah, oh, well, I don't know. I'll leave it to you to figure those out later. The first four commandments have everything to do with your vertical relationship with God. They're about loving God, about keeping the Sabbath, about honoring the name of of your God. They're all about your vertical relationship and love for God. The last six have to do with horizontal relationships, love your neighbor. Don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness, and so forth. 
It's interesting. The, 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 the commandments themselves, the progression begins with get your heart right with God first. And that will flow into your relationship with other people and how you live in the world. Jesus quotes only commandments from five on down, only the horizontal relationships. Did you notice that? He, com- he, co- he quotes the guy, you know the law, don't steal, don't b- commit adultery, don't bear false witness, don't murder. The guy goes, I've kept all those. What does he leave out? What does Jesus not mention? Any of the first four. Nothing about your relationship with God. I think that's, I think that's not accidental. Why? Because that's this guy's issue. Perhaps we're seeing a man who on the surface of it externally is keeping all the rules. At least on a human level, he's about as good as it gets. He's doing all of the things externally that his religion requires. He's tithing and he's serving and he's giving to the poor and he's not committing the big sins that everyone sees and he's being a good man as we would define good man. But his heart's not right. And that's really important. It's very possible to be good in the eyes of the world and have a heart far from God. It's common, sadly. To do to, the gospel of sin management, right? Clean up my act, be a pretty good guy. We think God grades on the curve. I'm keeping the rules, most of them better than that guy. But Jesus knows what's going on in his heart. And this is the third part, a challenge to the heart. A challenge to his heart. Verse 21, Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go sell everything, everything you have, and give to the poor, and then you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. What's Jesus doing here? I think the most... The turning point is when Jesus, you know, this, this passage right here, and probably the, the heart of these two verses is the phrase, he looked at him and loved him. It's easy to skim right over that and think Jesus gives him a zinger. Gotcha. You're greedy, you know. Sell your money. Like he's, like he's, he's, it's easy to read this, at least I do this. Maybe this exposes my heart. I tend to read it as if he, Jesus is exposing him to the crowd. See, this guy's not as good as you all think he is. That's happening, but not because Jesus is out to get him. He looks at him, and he loves him. And I think it's extraordinary because the guy is not all that lovable, is he? If you think about this man who comes to Jesus with a bit of an edge to him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I've done all that. What else is there kind of thing? It's not a guy that you would naturally be drawn to. It's possible to be a good man and not well-liked, too, on on the world's eyes to do right and be a jerk about it. This guy's not all that lovable. He was rich, he was smart, he was arrogant, he's showboating for the crowd, or just self-deceived, and Jesus looked at him and loved him. Guys don't talk about this that often, but I, I think every one of you here, I know every one of you here, has your thing, your hang up, that if Jesus were speaking to you, he would say, this is in your way. This is in your way with me. This is something I want you to deal with. This is something I want you to lay aside. But I hope you can hear out of this text, God saying to you, he looks at you and he loves you. Not, what a, what a disaster, what a wreck. I have to talk to this guy again about this. How many times have we had this conversation? Andrew, you know. <laughs> He's sitting right there and works on staff so I can, I can play God. No, I'm kidding. But he says to all of us, but he lo- it's because he loves him. You know, there's a great story in Luke chapter 7 uh, where Jesus has dinner at a Pharisee's house. And the Pharisee uh, invites him over, but intentionally snubs him and ignores him and embarrasses him in front of the crowd. Doesn't anoint his head with oil, doesn't wash his feet, doesn't kiss them. And this is the story, you probably heard this part about it, where a sinful woman comes into the dinner party, and you're thinking, well, how did she get in, right? Well, it's an open courtyard, most likely, open to the public on one side, like a horseshoe. That's the, where the houses were built. She's in the crowd, and she makes her way to Jesus, who's at the table. Not a table like you're sitting at, but a low table like Middle Eastern culture, where he's reclining on his elbow, leaning in with his feet out behind him. She's at at his feet, weeping, wetting them with her tears and wiping them with her hair. You remember this? She pours perfume on, on Jesus' feet. And Jesus looks at this Pharisee across the table 
and he says to his name is Simon. Actually, the text says Jesus looks at the woman and says to Simon, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he says. Two men owed money, one owed 50, one owed 500. Neither one could pay. So the money lender canceled the debt of both. Now, which one will love him more? Pretty obvious. And the guy says, uh, I suppose the one with the bigger debt canceled. Jesus says, give the boy a cigar. He doesn't say that. He says, <laughs> says bingo, you answered correctly. And he says, I, then he turns to the woman. He says, do you see this woman? Since I entered, she's not stopped kissing my feet or wiping them with her hair. You gave me no oil for my head or water for my feet. He says, I tell you that even though she has sinned much, she's been forgiven much. Her sins, though they are many, have been forgiven. For he who's been forgiven much loves much. The point of Simon is what? You think you're the guy who only owes a little bit in the little parable. But there's no such thing as a small debtor in God's kingdom. Here's the question why I tell that story. Why does Jesus tell that story to Simon? To expose him as the fraud that he is? To shame him in front of his dinner guests? To embarrass him the way he embarrassed Jesus? To insult him? No. He tells that story because he loves that guy. That hard-hearted, arrogant, prideful, selfish man. He loves that guy. And he tells the story to get to his heart. It's the same thing that's going on here. It's, it's no secret that in the, in the pages of the Bible, Jesus loves the broken, the outcast, those that are oppressed, those that are marginalized. He clearly does, and he moves towards them and cares for them. He also loves the jerks that are oppressing them. He also loves the comfortable, the secure, and the self-righteous. And he loves this guy. I think this is profound. He loves this guy. And in many ways, this guy's us in our culture. He looks at him, and he loves him. And he says, one thing you lack. Have you seen the movie City Slickers? The secret of life is this. Billy Crystal goes, your finger? No. One thing. Remember Jack the Hunts? Do you see how leathery he was? He's like a saddlebag with eyes. I love that line. <laughs> and he goes, what is it? It's what you got to figure out. I love that, that scene, Jack Palance, you know? In a way, Jesus is saying, one thing you lack. Go sell everything you have, give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Why does he put it this way? Why does he say this? Why doesn't he say, one thing you lack is your heart's not right? Why doesn't Jesus just say, one thing you lack is you got to love me more? Why not just say that? Why say this? Is he saying, this is it, guys. It comes down to this. The one thing for all of us is sell everything. Give it all away. You're all sinning against God because you have way too much. And the world's economy, we're the richest one half of 1%. We compare ourselves to each other and we feel like we don't have that much. But in the, in the world's economy, we do have way more. Is that what Jesus is saying here? No. He's not saying that. I'll ask you again, why do you think Jesus says this to this guy? Why not just say your heart's not right? Because this is the thing. This is the place where his heart is not right. This is the primary thing in his way of loving God, surrendering to God. Remember, uh, Pastor Brian talked a couple weeks ago, I think, about when you, who your God is, small g. Not who you say your God is, but who your functional God is. Do you remember this conversation? Whatever you offer extravagant devotion to. I think the best way you could think about who your functional God is in your life, what you're actually worshiping, is if you were to take a, if you were to do a spreadsheet and analyze where, where, is, where is my wealth going, where is my time going? And then think, where are my thoughts going? What do I daydream or fantasize about? That will give you a pretty good indication of what your functional God is in life. And he knows when it comes to this young man, he's keeping the rules on the surface, but functionally speaking, his God is not God. <laughs> he's not surrendered. His God is his wealth. He's, he's held captive by it. And so he tells him, go and sell. And, and, and the, the most, the saddest part here in this, in this story is what? What does the guy do? Jesus drives right at the heart. And the saddest part of the story to me is what happens at the end. We would like it to be like movies are today or like shows are, right? All tied up nice and neat at the end of 30 minutes or two and a half hours. The man goes away sad because he had great wealth. We don't know what happened to this guy. In fact, the only thing that comes after this is, is 
The disciples talk to Jesus about this, and Jesus says, I tell you the truth, it's harder for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And they go, what? Well, what that, that's impossible. Have you seen a camel, Jesus? That's huge. None of us, what hope is there for any of us, they say. And Jesus says, you're right. You're right. With God, it's impossible. I mean, with, with man, it's impossible. With God, all things are possible. That's what he says. Meaning, the st- the, his point is this. You cannot get your heart right by external obedience alone. You can keep the rules, but you can't tr- transform a heart. And there's always something in your way, whatever that thing is. Jesus goes right for your heart. And the guy goes away sad. Here are the discussion questions for you around your tables. Has there been a time in your life when you would have identified with the young man in the story, thinking you were good enough? Perhaps some of you grew up in uh, traditions, religious traditions or denominations where it was all about external behavior. It was all about keeping the rules. And maybe you could identify with this guy or you felt like you you were good enough, or maybe you didn't. Number two, if you're able to have a conversation with that wealthy young man, what questions would you try to ask in order to engage him in a conversation about Jesus? And I'll add a third if you want to jot it down. And this might be a stretch for some of you on your tables. You might stare awkwardly at each other over this question. But if you were the young man and Jesus said to you, one thing you lack, what would, he, what would it be? What would he tell you you need to deal with, get rid of, face in order to love him well. Okay, grab another donut, have your discussion. In a few minutes, I'll wrap us up in prayer.